a very good morning aspirants welcome to the weekly the indian express newspaper analysis brought to you by shankar ias academy so in this video we have chosen some of the news articles very relevant for the upsc exam from the indian express and we have presented to you in the upsc perspective so give your feedbacks in the comment displayed here or the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today so without much delay let us get into the news article discussion look at this article from economy page this article talks about open market operation omo of rbi see rbi has recently announced omo in order to maintain liquidity in the system usually omo will allow interest rates to rise in order to keep inflation under control so here omo does not worry to sacrifice economic growth consumer spending and employment for the sake of keeping inflation under control this is the reason why the sudden announcement of omo has surprised the market this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us understand about omo and its impacts on the market before that we shall learn some of the basics about inflation what is inflation as you all know inflation is a general increase in the prices of goods and services in an economy which means that when the general price level rises each unit of currency buys fewer goods and services consequently inflation corresponds to a reduction in the purchasing power of money the two main indicators of inflation in india are the wholesale price index wpi and the consumer price index cpi now also remember this inflation is not always too bad for the economy a moderate level of inflation is always necessary to maintain price stability by preventing deflation it also helps in increasing wages for employees leading to improved standard of living for workers and it also supports consumer spending moderate inflation also means that there is demand for goods and services in the economy so the businesses will raise their prices earn higher profits and invest more than usual for these reasons moderate inflation is necessary but too much inflation will have an impact on the common man so government generally try to keep inflation within an optimal range that promotes growth without drastically reducing the purchasing power of the currency there are many methods used to control inflation i have displayed here you can pause the video and go through it now coming to omo omo is a monetary policy measure taken by the rbi to control the liquidity in the system to conduct an open market operation the rbi enters the financial markets and either buys or sells government securities like treasury bills bonds or notes to commercial banks financial institutions or the public now let's briefly discuss about the process involved in the omo operation see if the rbi's goal is to expand the money supply and boost demand the policy is expansionary here the rbi buys securities and injects money into the banking system that is the rbi will buy the bonds that has been already listed by banks by buying it rbi indirectly provides money to the bank this increases the reserve of the bank and puts downward pressure on interest rates so lower interest rates can encourage borrowings and spendings stimulating economic activity while this type of omo lowers interest rates after some period of time if rbi's goal is to contract the money supply and decrease demand the policy becomes contractionary in nature during this time RBI sells securities and removes money from the banking system that is RBI now it will list its own bonds or government securities and it will make the bank to buy those bonds from the RBI so this reduces the reserves of bank and put downward pressure on interest rates higher interest rates can discourage borrowing and spending which can help control inflation or cool down an overheated economy So these are the two ways how government controls liquidity using OMO. See historically the October to May period is observed to have high cash withdrawals due to festival and wedding seasons. This generally tends to reduce the durable liquidity in the banking system. So to keep liquidity under control this measure has been announced recently by the RBI. Hope you could get an clear picture. 
Now talking about the impacts of the OMO, see OMO directly impacts the money supply in the economy. Buying securities increase the money supply while selling securities reduces it. Secondly, central banks like RBI use OMOs to influence short term interest rate in the interbank lending market. So by adjusting the supply of money in the banking system, central banks can guide interest rates towards their target level. For example, if a central bank wants to lower interest rates to stimulate borrowing and investment, it will conduct expansionary OMOs. Thirdly, OMOs provide central banks with flexibility and precision in implementing monetary policy. They can be used frequently and adjusted as needed to respond to changing economic conditions. Fourthly, OMO are typically conducted openly and are announced to the public, contributing to the transparency of a central bank's actions and intentions. Finally, central banks can choose the maturity and duration of the securities they buy or sell. This will allow them to target specific segments of the yield curve. For example, short term securities, for example, treasury bills will impact short term interest rates, while long term securities, for example, bonds influence long term rates. So these are all some of the important points that you have to remember about OMO, a very potential preliminary question topic so have a clarity regarding this with this learned points now let us move on to the next news article now take a look at this article from Monday's newspaper the article conveys the story of Vasily Arkipov and how it is relevant in today's world we all know that October 2nd is the birthday of Mahatma Gandhi the day is also observed as the United Nations International Day of Nonviolence so instead of simply remembering Mahatma Gandhi's birthday as a tradition in order to celebrate courage, especially in a world that often glorifies aggression, it's more valuable to remember a single act of bravery that saved the world for the time being. In that sense, Vasily Arkhipov, who was a Soviet naval officer, is a great example. You can quote this example in your ethics and essay papers. So let me start with the story of Vasily Arkhipov. See, Arkhipov was commander of a Soviet flotilla and executive officer of the diesel-powered submarine B-59, which was submerged near Cuba in October 1962. Here, flotilla is nothing but a small fleet of ships. 1962 was the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, where both the US and Soviet Union were at the peak of their Cold War. The Cuban Missile Crisis was a 13-day confrontation between the US and Soviet Union concerning American ballistic deployment in Italy and Turkey with consequent Soviet ballistic missile deployment in Cuba. So the confrontation between both the countries started in October 16, 1962 and it just lasted for 13 days till October 28, 1962. Initially, US has deployed ballistic missiles in Italy and Turkey. So in retaliation, Soviet deployed ballistic missile in Cuba. Now this situation would have developed into a full-fledged nuclear war between US and Soviet Union leading to Third World War. But courageously it was prevented by one man's decision. The man is none other than Mr. Vasily Arkhipov. See what happened was on October 27th, US Navy destroyers detected the presence of Soviet submarines and began dropping depth charges to force the Soviet submarines to surface. Here depth charges is nothing but an anti-submarine weapon which is dropped from a ship or aircraft near a target. This weapon descends to a predetermined depth where it explodes. This explosion causes powerful and destructive hydraulic shocks that can damage the submarines. So, US Navy, they wanted the Soviet submarines to surface above the sea. So, for that reason, US dropped depth charges on Soviet submarines. But by then, the Soviet submarines had gone for many days without radio contact with Moscow. So some of the Soviet naval officers, they interpreted the dropping of depth charges as a signal that war has broke out between US and USSR. 
So the captain of B-59 insisted that it was time for them to launch a nuclear torpedo. I hope you all know what is a nuclear torpedo. Fortunately, Soviet naval protocol required that three officers on board that ship had to authorize a nuclear launch. So two of the designated officers were in favor of firing the nuclear weapon. And it was Arkhipov as chief of staff of the brigade who refused to go along. He did not vote to fire the nuclear weapon. Mr. Akibao, who had a reputation for being courageous, finally persuaded the captain of the submarine to surface and await orders from Moscow on October 28, 1969. That is the day after the incident happened. Both Washington and Moscow backed down and the missile crisis ended. So, B-59 peacefully sailed back to Soviet Union. Just imagine what would have happened if Arkhipo voted in favor of firing the nuclear weapon. The world that we live in today would have undergone multiple changes. In 2002, the then director of the U.S. National Security Archive called Arkhipo the man who saved the world. Now, this story highlights two vital truths. Firstly, violence and non-violence are not binary opposites, but it is a spectrum within which most people are in constant motion. That is, Mr. Arkhipov, even though he is more courageous and he is a person who would vote for the firing of the nuclear torpedo, he itself resisted to choose violence. This is the meaning of the first truth. Secondly, courage and clear-sightedness of a single individual can sometimes make a hugely significant difference particularly when that individual is empowered within the state structure. So here again the decision of Arkhipov has actually saved the world. Here Arkhipov had the choice to choose and he chose non-violence. So the story of Arkhipov is relevant even today. Because in many societies, a large number of people display an enthusiasm for answering violence with stronger violence. A lot of war happening around us is a very big example for this. All of them know that violence is not the solution and violence will leave the original problem unsolved. But still people choose violence because people fear that an outright rejection of violence will make them weak and vulnerable. Non-violence in today's world is seen as a self-defeating doctrine. But actually, non-violence has the power to transform opponents through love and compassion. So in that line, Archipau's story shows us the importance of self-resistance even when we have the means for violent action and how it's not a weakness but a strength. Remember, there might be a risk in choosing resistance. But it is always better than the potential harm caused by aggressive actions. So we should honor those who, like Archipau, chose self-resistance over aggression in their Archipau moments. They contribute to our progress as a species towards a more peaceful and compassionate world. This is a very strong message that you have to recall in the United Nations International Day of Nonviolence. So make note of this example and use it in your main answer. So with this points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this article from Monday's newspaper. This news article talks about the Ken Betua River Linkage Project. Suddenly it is in news because of the upcoming state assembly election of Madhya Pradesh. Due to elections, the state government is fastening the implementation of the project. So in this news article discussion, let us understand the basics of this Ken Betwa Link Project. See the Ken Betwa Link Project, KBLP, is the river interlinking project that aims to transfer surplus water from the Ken River in Madhya Pradesh to Betwa in Uttar Pradesh to irrigate the drought prone Bundelkhand region. Mundelkan region spread across the districts of two states, mainly Jansi, Banda, Lalitpur and Mahoba districts of UP and Tigamgarh, Panna and Chatarpur districts of MP. The project involves building a 77 meter tall and a 2 kilometer wide 
Dawthan Dam and a 230 km canal. Remember, Ken Betwa is one of the 30 river interlinking projects conceived across the country. Talking about the significance of the project, see the project will not only accelerate the water conservation by construction of a multi-purpose dam, but will also produce 103 megawatts of hydropower and it will supply drinking water to 62 lakh people. Now these advantages are also associated with concerns. Let us see them one by one. Firstly, the project passes through critical tiger habitat of Panna Tiger Reserve. Because of this reason, the project is stuck in for the approval from National Green Tribunal, NGT and other higher authorities. Secondly, there is a huge economic cost attached with the project implementation and maintenance and it is further rising due to delays in project implementation. Thirdly, reconstruction and rehabilitation cost due to displacement resulting from the implementation of the project will improve social cost as well. There are also concerns that the project will endanger the water security of Panna. Apart from this, there are significant legal problems with the approval granted to KBLP. For example, approval by the Standing Committee of the National Board for Wildlife to the Ken Betwa Link project has not been proved to be necessary for the improvement and better management of the wildlife therein as provided in Section 35, Clause 6 of the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. So these are all some of the important points that you have to remember about Ken Betwa River Linkage Project. See if UPSC is going to ask question in this particular area, UPSC might ask about the origin and the draining states of Ken and Betwa rivers. In mains, UPSC might ask about the impacts or the positives and negatives of interlinking of rivers. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this article, 10th October is observed as the World Mental Health Day to raise awareness of mental health issues around the world and to mobilize efforts in support of mental health. See, mental health is actually everything. It encompasses an individual's emotion and cognitive state as well as their ability to manage stress, relate to others, make decisions and handle life's challenges. Also remember, good mental health doesn't mean the absence of mental health issues. Rather, it implies the ability to cope with life's ups and downs efficiently. Some of the characteristics of positive mental health includes emotional well-being, that is the ability to experience a range of emotions, managing them and expressing them appropriately. Secondly, resilience, that is the capacity to bounce back from adversity and stress, adopt to change and maintain a sense of balance and well-being. Thirdly, the ability to build and maintain healthy, fulfilled relationships with others. Fourthly, the skill to manage life's challenges and stressors in a constructive manner, that is having an effective coping strategy. Then having a positive self-esteem and self-confidence and a self-assuredness in one's ability and self-worth. These are some of the characteristics of positive mental health. Apart from this, a positive mental health have the character and ability to understand and empathize with others and show kindness and concern. A positive mental health will also help in balancing the demand of work, personal life and leisure time to prevent excessive stress. So this is the reason why I said mental health is everything. So on the occasion of the World Mental Health Day, many articles related to mental health appeared in the newspaper. So in this news article discussion, let us understand the determinants of mental health and the steps taken by the government to prevent mental health. See, learning these concepts will enhance your understanding of ethical concepts and emotional intelligence. So now let's start with the determinants of mental health. Remember, multiple individual, social and structural determinants combine to protect or undermine our mental health. For example, individual psychological and biological factors like emotional skill, subject use and genetics can make people more vulnerable to mental health problems. 
secondly exposure to unfavorable social economical geopolitical and environmental circumstances this includes poverty violence inequality and environmental deprivation all these increases people's risk of experiencing mental health conditions thirdly risk can manifest themselves at all stages of life but those that occur during developmentally sensitive periods especially early childhood or particularly detrimental for example harsh parenting and physical punishments is known to undermine child health and bullying is a leading risk factor for mental health conditions finally an individual's social and emotional skills and attributes as well as positive social interactions quality education decent work safe neighborhood and community cohesion all these can enhance mental health of an individual so these are all some of the determinants of the mental health now let's move on to the initiatives of the indian government to ensure the mental health of the people is taken care Firstly the national mental health program has been launched by the Indian government to address the huge burden of mental disorder and shortage of qualified professionals in the field of mental health the program was re-strategized in 2003 to include two schemes that is modernization of state mental hospitals and upgradation of psychiatric wings of medical colleges or general hospitals Secondly district mental health program DMHP of 1996 was also launched to provide community mental health services at the primary health care level Thirdly the mental health care act 2017 guarantees every affected person access to mental health care and treatment from services run or funded by the government It has also significantly reduced the scope for the use of Section 309 IPC and made the attempt to commit suicide punishable only as an exception. Apart from this, in 2020, the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment launched a 24 by 7 toll-free helpline, Kiran, to provide support to people facing anxiety, stress, depression, suicidal thoughts, and other mental health concerns. There is also an initiative called Manodarpan Initiative. It is an initiative of the Ministry of Education aimed to provide psychological support to students, family members and teachers for their mental health and well-being during the times of COVID-19 pandemic. There is also a mobile app called Manas, M A N A S. In 2021, the government of India launched the Manas The expansion of the mobile app is Mental Health and Normalcy Augmentation System. This app promotes mental well-being across age groups. Manas was endorsed as a national program by the Prime Minister's Science, Technology and Innovation Advisory Council as well. So these are all some of the important points that you have to remember about mental health. This year in UPSC GS Paper 1, there was a question related to suicidal deaths among indian youth so in future also there might be questions related to mental health so that is why we chose this article to be discussed today okay so these learned points and all let us move on to the next news article discussion take a look at this article recently imf has raised india's gdp forecast for the current financial year by 20 basis points to 6.3 percentage CIMF has done this mainly due to the strong consumption pattern during April to June quarters. This is the crux of the article given here. In this context, let us quickly go through some of the important facts about IMF. See the International Monetary Fund or IMF works to achieve sustainable growth and prosperity for all of its 190 member countries. It does so by supporting economic policies that promote financial stability and monetary cooperation. It was established in 1944 and now the IMF is governed by and accountable to those 190 countries that make up its near global membership. Then when we take the institutional setup of IMF, see it has a board of governors. It consists of one governor and one alternative governor for each member countries. 
each member country appoints its two governors and the board of governors is advised by two ministerial committee the international monetary and financial committee imfc and the development committee so what does the imf actually do see imf has three critical missions first one is furthering international monetary cooperation second is encouraging the expansion of trade and economic growth and third is discouraging policies that would harm prosperity so to fulfill these missions imf member countries work collaboratively with each other and with other international bodies so how does imf work see firstly the imf gives policy advice here the imf monitors economic and financial developments and advises countries secondly the imf provide financial assistance that is loan and other financial assistance to member countries especially for countries experiencing actual or potential balance of payments problems thirdly the imf provides for capacity development that is by providing technical assistance and training to help governments to implement sound economic policies apart from this as part of its world economic and financial surveys the imf publishes flagship reports on multilateral surveillance twice a year they include world economic outlook weo global financial stability report gfsr and financial monitor fm now let's quickly see about specific information regarding imf and india so india is a founding member of the imf IMF has provided several loans to India at many critical situations and after the creation of the special drawing rights which was created in the year 1969 the assistance that India can obtain from IMF has been increased here special drawing rights or SDR is nothing but an international reserve asset created to supplement its member countries official reserves okay the value of SDR is based on a basket of five currencies the five currencies include us dollar the euro the chinese renminbi the japanese yen and the british pound sterling remember india has occupied a special place in the board of directors of the fund so india had played a credible role in determining the policies of the fund this has also increased the prestige of india in the international circles so these are all some of the important facts that you have to remember about imf So these learned points, and now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this article. This article talks about Claudia Golden. She is a Harvard University professor who has won the Nobel Economic Prize for her research that helps explain why women have disadvantageous outcomes in terms of occupation and wages, even when they are just as qualified as men. Her research exposed that. the labor market are not gender neutral and not working efficiently to choose the best person for the job remember professor claudia golden is only the third woman to have won the prize for economics and the first to do it solo so in this news article discussion let us understand some of the findings of her research see initially golden tracked us data for over more than 3 decades Her focus was on the big picture questions of how women's labor force participation LFP and gender wage gaps have evolved historically. While tracking it she found a U-shaped relationship between economic development and women's LFP instead of an upward trend. In other words she exhibited that the economic growth in various periods did not result in a reduction in gender inequalities in the labor market she found that countries at low levels of economic development have relatively higher levels of female lfp as women are engaged in agriculture that too as unpaid workers on family farms as income increases due to industrialization and introduction of new technologies women withdraw from paid work and went back into the home this was mainly because industrialization had made it harder for married women to work from home since they would not be able to balance the demands of their family 
even though golden's research held that unmarried women were employed in manufacturing during the industrial era the overall female force in the labor market declined remember this does not mean that their working hours varied even though they left their jobs women had to work for longer hours so only their labor force participation declined but not their working hours so as countries develop and women's education rises further women moved back into paid work again social stigma legislation and other institutional barriers limited their influence now another pivotal factor was the introduction of birth control pills this created conditions for women to plan their careers better now even if the pills influenced educational and career choices this did not translate to the disappearance of the earnings gap between men and women so what is the factor that led to this menace see the only factor playing here is occupational segregation where women work in stereotypically feminine jobs that are lower paying let me explain this according to golden gender wage gaps at entry level are not significant but going up the occupational ladder she highlights the phenomenon of greedy jobs which have massive wage premiums but in turn require long working hours networking late night meetings and travel so in a family of two working parents with kids only one parent would be able to afford to work this way the other would be on the mummy track that is continuing in less demanding jobs which would allow them to take care of kids school homework sports music lessons and doctor visits here the issue is the mummy track parent does not literally have to be the mother but most often the mother is in the mummy track so this creates a large pay gap between men and women because the men is in the greedy job and the woman is on mummy track so according to golden several factors have historically influenced and are still influencing the supply and demand for female labors these includes opportunities for combining paid work and a family decisions and expectations related to pursuing education and raising children then technical innovation laws and norms and the structural transformation in an economy she also highlights the issue in this unequal paradigm here both men and women they lose while men are able to have a family and step up because women step back in terms of their jobs but both are deprived while men forgo time with their family and women often forgo their career so through this research golden made it clear that the labor market work very differently for men and women and the solution here lies in the future where women have a career as well as a spouse who wants what they want for example men sometimes can be the mummy track parent and support the female counterpart to achieve her dream this could turn the u trend upward now let's quickly see how the findings of claudia golden are applicable to india see india's female labor force participation has fallen over the past two decades as the jobs moved from farm to construction manufacturing and services The state of working India report by Azim Premji University shows a U-shaped pattern for urban married working women in India too. Women's chance of going out to work falls as their husbands pay rises but increases again as the figure crosses 40000 rupees per month. The gender pay gap is also very huge. with women earning just 76% of what men does so in this context india should focus on higher education investments and since family life is shaping the wage gaps raising the age of marriage could also be a solution so these are all some of the very important points that you have to remember about the findings of claudia golden you can use it as a case study or an example in your main answer or you can use it in your essay as well okay 
So with this we shall wind up and we will be meeting on another session. If you like the video do not forget to like, subscribe and share it with your friends. So thank you so much for listening.